So one of the advantages of working in the space of CNS vasculitis is that the, 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 the field moves at kind of a glacial pace. So I, I, don't have, I have no randomized controlled trials to show you. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, if you've heard me speak in the last year, it's pretty much going to be um, uh, uh, an iteration of that because all of these presentations are iterative. But what this field does provide um, is really a kind of a critical appraisal of our ability to engage in clinical decision making. That's what, uh, this is really a, a metaphor for good uh, diagnostic reasoning. So this is as much on diagnostic reasoning as it is about this uh, complicated uh, area of CNS vasculitis this afternoon. Uh, those of you that are interested have already signed up for the workshop on this. You can get into a more granular um, uh, phase. I have no disclosures in this area. There's nothing approved and not much uh, uh, in that area. We have some references. Um, I'm going to go through this in uh, really two stanzas. We're going to talk about um, diagnosis and all the uh, aspects that go into diagnostic reasoning and then uh, some case examples of how we go about this. So if we go back a little bit and talk about diagnostic process in general, um, it is really poor, poorly understood uh, concept. You know, for something that we do every single day, every single minute, you work in that little cubicle and then somebody comes in and has a complaint and they tell you, you know, tell you all about their problems and then, you know, sometime later, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour comes by, you, you come out of there and you have some list of things on your mind of what might be the problem. Sometimes it's instantaneous and sometimes it's, it's not. But uh, the, uh, the, the mental... Uh, uh, processes that go into this um, are, are poorly understood. At the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine, um, um, which is, uh, 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 I'm uh, very uh, proud to uh, uh, be on the faculty, uh, one of the students uh, for the past five years has been Watson, and um, Watson is um, learning uh, very rapidly. Uh, in terms of taking in this uh, wealth of data. Um, and we're trying to understand these processes a, a little bit more. So uh, uh, we, we look to uh, uh, try to exploit this partnership with IBM uh, over the next few years. Those that study diagnostic reasoning generally consider that we use dualistic thinking in diagnosis. Um, system one, which I like to refer to as right brain, which is really not right brain, but in the concept of right brain, left brain, um, is uh, th that uh, thought process which originates in the deeper parts of the brain and generally relies on very little evidence to come to a conclusion. Um, uh, as I'll say, I mention uh, uh, Patrick Crossgury, who's done so much to help us understand this whole process. Uh, calls this thin slicing. Take a little bit of data, make a large sweeping conclusion. Uh, we often uh, consider this synonymous with pattern recognition. You know, you're in the vasculitis clinic at the, at the Mayo Clinic and the next guy comes in, he's got this collapsed nose and you, you say, this is probably going to be GPA. And you're probably going to be right in that setting. Um, it can be used very, very effectively. And it's the system of experts but it can be used tragically um, when um, um, things go awry. You know, here's the patient. Um, you're called in to you look at the thing, and this patient has had this terrible pain in the in the back uh, for seven days, and you're kind of going in and see what this is all about. You don't know anything more about that, and the patient is ungowned, and you walk in and you see this. You know that this is shingles. You know this is what's causing the back pain. Um, and the problem is solved uh, with, you know, 99. nines uh, percent probability. But on the other hand, um, not all problems are solved so simply, right? And we have to use system two. This is brute strength diagnosis. Uh, when the diagnosis does not immediately come to mind, 
uh, it's often hypothetical deductive. We create some uh, lists of things that we have to now uh, dig into and use tests that we understand the operating characteristics of sensitivity and specificity in this setting. Um, uh, uh, this really involves probabilistic reasoning, and a lot of it is Bayesian reasoning, even if though we, we're, we, we don't feel, uh, at, you know, one um, uh, with uh, 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 calculating Bayes' uh, theorem. This is a woman who comes in and says, I've had this headache for three months. I don't feel myself. I don't feel anything like I should be feeling, period. Okay, where do you go with this? There's no instantaneous diagnosis here. Now you've got to start asking all the questions. You know, are you depressed? Are you this? Are you that? Are you having fevers? Are you having weight loss? Um, et cetera. This is uh, not a system one thin slicing diagnosis. So when we compare these, you know, system one, we often rely on these rules of thumb uh, to make these diagnoses. Uh, it, it requires very little energy. It's not highly reliable uh, unless it's uh, administered by an expert. And here's a secret. Um, experts are only experts in their field. And uh, you know, if you take that same patient who's in the vasculitis clinic at the Mayo Clinic um, and you put them in the dermatology clinic or something like that, it doesn't work as well. Um, but we need system one because it's time efficient and uh, we often cut through things. System two um, is uh, rule-based, high energy, high investment. Uh, anyone who's really interested in pursuing this, um, Crossgury has written elegantly, I, I love this um, editorial piece in the New England Journal on cognitive bias and clinical decision making, so uh, please look into it. So we usually use both of these types of reasoning um, and we need checks and balances uh, whenever we're seeing patients with complex diseases. And I can't think of a better place to start uh, than, than in a conference on uh, clinical aspects of vasculitis. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of these checks and balances as we go through. One of the things that we all use are uh, what we call heuristics, uh, these shortcuts of mental reasoning, these rules of thumb. Um, that um, each and every one of us use generally subliminally. And this is, this is part of the, uh, 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 the problem. And I'm going to talk to you about solutions that, you know, the, uh, these are, um, uh, we call them heuristics because they're shortcuts. And there are many types. There's over 35 that uh, Crossgree has uh, outlined. But availability, you know, I, I, the last patient I saw with that collapsed nose had GPA and I think that this is probably GPA here because that's what was available to me. Uh, I remember this. I've just been working in this clinic for the past two years where every the single patient has had the same diagnosis. Anchoring is when we make this diagnosis and yet some things just don't fall into place. Um, none of the attendant signs or symptoms are there, or there are other atypical findings, yet we cling to that diagnosis, despite um, uh, things that fall out of reasonable confines. So that's another uh, 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 challenge of a heuristic. The representative heuristic is when we only want to make a diagnosis when it fits the classical or iconic uh, 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 picture. You know, the patient uh, who comes in with, uh, uh, you know, cranial um, uh, pain, scalp tenderness, um, and who has some polymyalgia type of uh, symptoms, you know, we're all over this uh, for giant cell arteritis. Uh, but the, uh, you know, octogenarian uh, who's lost, uh, uh, you know, 18 pounds uh, and has an anemia of uh, 8.7 grams and a sed rate of 60, um, it's probably going to have, you know, four colonoscopies before somebody thinks, could this be occult giant cell arteritis? So uh, a representative is when we have to think of this. And then we have time-honored um, shortcuts as, you know, is this, um, the, is this uh, uh, 
diagnostic parsimony? Is there only one thing going on to explain all of this? Or is this follow Hickam's dictum, uh, and William Hickam, the eponymous chair of medicine at the University of Indiana, his famous quote is, a patient can have as many diseases as he damn well pleases. And uh, so um, uh, we have to think of these things as we move along. So CNS vasculitis is a great exercise in diagnostic reasoning. It's rare, even in, uh, in the biggest places in the world, we don't have um, a, a, a highly enriched experience. You, you know, we, uh, it, there's not thousands of patients uh, that are bound for this. They're, they're relatively few. Even when we have the diagnosis in hand in a biopsy, we have a very small piece of tissue. There's no animal models, no highly efficient test of positive or negative predictive value um, to a certain degree. We use these diagnostic criteria uh, that have never been validated, but we think that they, have, uh, they do have face validity and uh, for the most part content validity as most studies have used these. Basically says you have an unexplained neurologic sign or symptom despite a vigorous workup. And how, oh, how that workup has changed over the past several decades, right? No explanation for that seizure, for that headache, for that stroke. Um, Secondly, some evidence of vascular disease in the brain, right? It going up either by evidence of angiography, showing something that's uh, vasculocentric, or a biopsy that actually shows that. But even in the presence of one and two, we have to rule out of all those other things that can either mimic the angiographic picture or cause secondary inflammation in the brain. The fact is, the fact is, is that uh, none of us uh, there's nobody on the planet that is an expert in both the CNS vasculitis and all of the mimics um, uh, that must be ruled out and that, that is evident to you and hopefully will be more evident as we go along. There are some exclusions at 30,000 feet fall into these clumps, systemic inflammatory diseases like all the vasculitides, which are usually quite straightforward. Um, Multiple strokes can always be due to uh, coagulation problems or thromboembolic disease, uh, a good explanation. Uh, the must rule outs, which we'll talk about as we go along, infections uh, being uh, of greatest concern, also malignancies, and then this kind of crazy uh, growing list of uh, uh, acquired and genetic diseases um, and unusual uh, uh, syndromes that uh, can involve brain um, that are nosologically indistinct. So we'll move from there. Uh, I made this slide up um, uh, last year, just reflecting on how this disease has changed um, over the past uh, three decades. Uh, diagnostically, we went from CT to MR to the world of, of, of um, agnostic molecular diagnosis. Um, we've gone from direct angiography to very um, uh, sophisticated indirect angiography and actual vascular wall imaging, um, uh, which is becoming more refined. And mimics over the past 30 years, there are now many diseases, uh, everything from the genetic diseases like Catacil or Caracil uh, or Milos, um, uh, new syndromes such as Clippers and uh, the whole group of interferonopathies that were never even described, and pathogens um, that have emerged over this time that can do this, and, uh, and then uh, vasospastic diseases. The palette of diagnostic uh, tools uh, have remained the same over this time. We have bedside diagnostic tools, we have some laboratory studies, we have an LP, uh, uh, neuroimaging, angiography, and biopsy. The technologies have changed within there, but the palette of options have stayed the same. So I'll, I'll apply some heuristics to each of these. So um, there's a number of people in here who are experts on this and um, uh, do this for a living, but for those of us that uh, only see these patients every now and then, I actually did a shout out to the rheumatology community a few years ago in terms of a needs assessment. And while the number of patients seen um, at any given institution or by any individual rheumatologist um, for, with, with CNS vasculitis is quite small. The question of whether the patient has uh, CNS vasculitis is actually quite common. And if you do any type of hospital work, um, uh, 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 it's easy to appreciate. So here are, the, here are seven shortcuts that um, uh, that belie the diagnosis. And once I go through these, I'll give you some cases 
um, uh, to, uh, that exemplify this. Unfortunately, there is <clears throat> no um, high probability set of clinical findings that you can walk in and uh, with uh, the right brain system one say, this is CNS vasculitis. It doesn't exist. It's not uh, the patient with GPA who's coughing up blood, who has a saddle nose and has RBC casts in their urine. Um, and the evidence to prove that is this. This is one of the uh, uh, robust series uh, from Mayo Clinic uh, 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 by uh, Carlo Salvarani, um, uh, looking at uh, over 100 patients. And this is like the dog that's not barking um, in terms of looking at um, signs and symptoms. Uh, it could be anything because uh, CNS vasculitis is capricious anatomically. And if you look at the entire spectrum, and you know, some patients may have ocular symptoms, some patients may have seizures, some patients may have strokes, some patients can have movement disorders, um, uh, uh, may be non-focal. Um, it does not work. Yet, at the same time, there are three clinical scenarios that warrant serious consideration of CNS vasculitis, as always. First, the patient with chronic aseptic meningitis. They've got cells, protein, normal glucose, and it's been there for um, uh, uh, a month or more. Uh, the definition of that is um, uh, uh, somewhat ambiguous. But chronic meningitis needs an explanation. It has the same differential diagnosis as FUO, uh, but uh, CNS vasculitis um, is important. Multiple strokes in multiple anatomic areas distributed over time. You have to have an explanation for it. Um, is it uh, emboli? Is it thrombosis? Um, is it uh, spasm? Is it um, some other type of obliterative vascular disease? Uh, vasculitis, uh, at least we should be thinking of this. And then that patient with unexplained both focal and diffuse neurologic dysfunction. You know, having a, patients with CNS vasculitis virtually never present with a simple stroke, just, just low pretest probability. But if that patient had behavioral defects and neurocognitive dysfunction for the eight weeks before they had the stroke, totally different ball game, right? Um, all these other <coughs> features uh, you can look at at your leisure. Number two, if there is any rule to adhere to uh, in the evaluation of such patients is that there is no option other than to do a lumbar puncture. And um, it, it, uh, it is, is important for ruling out uh, the major mimics and the must rule outs, um, as it is uh, for positive predictive value to have some perturbation of uh, CSF. It's very unusual to have frank um, uh, biopsy proven CNS vasculitis with a totally pristine CNS uh, uh, CSF fluid. Um, generally speaking, um, uh, cells, protein, normal glucose, and in fact, when it's perfectly normal, protein of 29. Uh, no cells, um, uh, no IgG synthesis, um, uh, normal glucose. Uh, it has pretty high negative predictive value. This is the snout mnemonic uh, that we use in evidence-based medicine. Tests of high sensitivity tend to rule out diagnosis, just like we know that you can have lupus with a negative ANA, but boy, it's not a great starting point to make this diagnosis, right? Um, Non-vascular neuroimaging. Over the past three decades, we've become increasingly uh, sophisticated uh, uh, because of the tools that we have. And these techniques have become far more sensitive, yet not appreciably more specific, at least for this diagnosis. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, the palette of, of um, uh, neuroimaging um, includes many things. Um, the standard generally is uh, uh, MRI, uh, and if there's high uh, pretest probability um, with enhancement and diffusive weighted imaging um, uh, as, as a standard bearer. Um, I've seen so many patients, literally, over the years who have come in with normal CTs, MRs, and something like an abnormal spec scan where this diagnosis is proffered. I've never seen this ever pan out to see a single patient that we felt have had CNS vasculitis. Um, so these are very, very highly sensitive. So what does that mean? So that patient who has a headache 
and some uh, uh, soft, uh, uh, you know, uh, diffuse neurologic symptomatology uh, who has a pristine MR um, and normal spinal fluid, um, um, uh, you're moving on from this diagnosis um, uh, fairly well. Yet at the same time, the, the, uh, the problem is that there's no specific findings. These are all patients that I've shown many, many times over the years who have had biopsy-proven CNS vasculitis from this uh, patient with these large subcortical um, uh, areas of increased um, uh, T2 signal intensity to this young man here that had both supra and infratentorial um, uh, uh, areas that uh, were ischemic uh, to this uh, uh, erstwhile mass lesion um, um, uh, and these patients with leptomeningeal enhancement, all with CNS vasculitis by biopsy. So there's nothing specific at that juncture. The fourth heuristic, uh, which uh, is known to uh, all of the, the vasculitis club, uh, is that in the world of CNS vasculitis, there is no angiographic picture that is 100% specific for diagnosis. No matter how famous the radiologist, how vociferous they are, no matter how they underline it in capitals or try to intimidate you, it just does not exist. Um, yes, there are some findings that are very, very, very suspicious, uh, but this is not an imaging technique um, that, uh, it, it, you know, um, my mentor when I was a, when I was a resident and, uh, you know, we, all you had was chest x-rays and uh, uh, for, for diagnosis of intrathoracic disease and you say, oh, this patient has pneumonia and this patient has this. And uh, he always said, these are only shadows, you know, it's not the diagnosis uh, that you're dealing with. The reason that uh, the lack of specificity is that uh, angiitis can affect any distribution. Large vessels in the brain are those at the base of the brain, and the small vessels are those unnamed arcades in the leptomeninges and the subcortical spaces. And the medium vessels are the ones that we see uh, best on um, angiograms, a little bit better on direct angiography, but indirect angiography of high quality is really uh, 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 increasingly relied upon. Um, unlike uh, vasculitis in the periphery where we talk about microaneurysms, that's really quite unusual. Although we do see microaneurysms in some spectrum of CNS vasculitis, particularly uh, those associated with monogenic primary immunodeficiencies. And, and uh, tomorrow morning, I think uh, Dr. Troy Torgerson uh, may be talking about uh, some of these. They're peculiar, but the interferonopathies seem uh, specifically predisposed to that. But outside of that, stenosis, ectasia, beating, sausaging, um, many of us uh, who see a lot of these feel like it has a, a look of spasm, it has a look of, of uh, something that is, uh, you know, possibly inflammatory. Uh, but people that have actually tried to apply metrics to this show that the angiogram is poorly specific from separating this out. This is actually a patient that had biopsy proven disease, although if I looked at it now, I'd probably think that this was more spasm. Um, and these are patients that have sausaging and the like that uh, had, uh, did not have CNS vasculitis. So um, the words of caution and um, we move from there. Biopsy is really important and I think it's an underutilized technique, not saying that everybody needs a CNS vasculitis, but the stakes are high. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, three reasons not to biopsy people that, that immediately come to mind. I actually asked uh, uh, rheumatologists why they don't get uh, much biopsies. The leading reason, what was the leading reason that uh, rheumatologists don't get biopsies? Yeah, the surgeons won't do them. All right, so that's a doctor problem. It's a doctor problem. It's not a, you're thinking right. Uh, and this is not something that should be done for the first time by somebody that, you know, is just deciding to do this. So places that do biopsies of benign um, intracranial lesions, this is very important. Um, uh, the, the second reason would be that the patient doesn't want to have the biopsy and that, you know, patients are autonomous. And I usually think, uh, in, in my experience, that that's a problem of shared and informed decision making. Um, um, uh, the biopsies can be done with uh, minimal morbidity uh, and we have uh, uh, 
tons of data uh, over the past several decades to suggest that. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the third reason is that there's often kind of faulty reasoning going on here. Saying, well, I know that this uh, biopsy is only 80% sensitive or 75% sensitive or whatever, and uh, what if we get a non-diagnostic biopsy? Then we're going to do the same thing. You're going to treat them, aren't you? Well, the, 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 there is some credibility to that. Um, uh, it will rule it in uh, if it's positive and you, you can uh, be, have impunity uh, for your therapy. Um, but uh, depending upon the, the, uh, the approach, which I don't want to get into, um, there will be false negative biopsies. But at the same time, um, you're doing it as much to rule out other conditions. And there have been several studies that have been done uh, both at uh, Duke and the University of Michigan, and this mirrors our experience, is that when um, a patient, when CNS vasculitis is in the differential and the biopsy is done, um, a significant number of uh, patients have um, uh, other diagnoses. Open core biopsy, I'm going to move along from there. There are some must rule outs. Um, you know, if this patient uh, has CNS sarcoid, and I think it's granulomatous angiitis of the central nervous system. You know, it's not the end of the world for the patient, and, and sometimes these things are very difficult to figure out. But if I say it's CNS vasculitis and it's actually uh, tuberculous uh, meningovascular disease, and uh, the, the outcome will be cataclysmic, um, that this is overlooked. So there are two must rule outs, infection and malignancy. And we have to think about these all the time. There are certain pathogens that uh, come to mind. Um, it's kind of a crazy area going on right now with VZV vasculopathy. We just had a patient with HSV vasculitis in the hospital. Um, uh, viruses uh, are kind of pro forma. Um, I predict within the next five years, uh, we won't be ordering any of this stuff that we will do uh, agnostically based uh, virologic detection. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we move along. Um, but depending upon the patient, there's a long list of other pathogens um, uh, that should be considered um, uh, in such patients. Malignancies uh, can be particularly problematic. 5% of patients with solid tumors have leptomeningeal uh, metastasis. Um, there are some very difficult uh, to separate out diseases. Um, uh, all of us every year who see this disease see several cases of CNS lymphoma that have mimicked this disease. And then finally, um, uh, experientially, uh, most uh, people who work in this area agree that a rigorous uh, treatment of cyclophosphamide and glucocorticoids that fails uh, is probably more likely to represent an, another diagnosis than um, uh, a failure of therapy. So uh, that's, a, that's an opinion, sea level data. Um, okay, so we're rheumatologists, right? Um, uh, one of the orientations to this is, is that you know, you're not called to the emergency room for the patient with the worst headache in their life. You're not doing a consult on a patient because they have a seizure disorder. You're not you know, uh, seeing somebody um, uh, just because they uh, you know, aren't thinking right. Somebody has to put something together to consult you um, uh, that this may come into your um, uh, 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 you know, contextual group of diagnoses. So it's usually based upon some type of diagnostic modality. Either they have an underlying autoimmune disease or they have an abnormal imaging um, or uh, lastly, they've actually done a biopsy and uh, calling you to uh, help um, with this scenario. And these are, the, these are the scenarios. Positive biopsy, love to see those, all right? That, very nice. Two, positive angiogram, hate to see those. Not good. Um, and three, uh, the best is like, we need your help. We just don't know what the hell's going on here. And, and will you please engage with us? Um, you know, do you think that this could be um, something related to an autoimmune or autoinflammatory disease, et cetera? So that's, that's the thing. So, all right, so uh, the case is the 46-year-old uh, uh, man um, who's already been uh, admitted to the hospital. He's a migrainer. Um, uh, he had some hypertension. He's known to uh, use some cannabis like everybody else. Um, 
Uh, he uh, develops this uh, terrible headache um, that actually, uh, uh, during sexual activity, um, headaches seemed to go away, but, and he was doing fine. Three days later, um, has another headache uh, come back just while he's sitting around. Um, and over a few hours of time, his, uh, vinish, his vision di uh, diminishes bilaterally. He goes in, he has these areas of cortical diffusion here. Uh, he has indirect angiography done, and you can see these, uh, this sausaging here, uh, beautiful uh, picture here, um, alternating stenosis and ectasia, multiple vascular beds. Uh, you are called to see this person because this is a high probability angiogram for vasculitis. So at this point, the patient's had an LP, it's normal. Hypercoag, TEE, normal. Based on this data and this angiogram, high probability, which you're told is vasculitis, the, the possibilities are um, primary angiitis, high probability, um, primary angiitis, intermediate probability, uh, primary angiitis, low probability, other diagnosis. All right, so A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. We're such a sophisticated crowd here. Um, and uh, you're good test takers because you're physicians here. So, all right, so, but there's still uh, half the group is uh, in the PACNS group and half the group is in the other diagnosis. So, uh, based on these data um, of unexplained deficit, no evidence of infection or malignancy, and a classic angiogram, you are now going to now treat. So, here you got some people here who got some stuff. So, one, Steroids alone. Two, steroids and cyclo. Three, I'm not buying this, I want a biopsy. Or four, I have something else in mind. So we're going, we're, I've got you scared. We're get, this patient is getting biopsied right now. Okay, so all right, so we, here we go. Good, this is great. All right, so angiographic diagnosis of CNS vasculitis equals natural signs of danger here. So you're, you're, you're very good. You're in the diagnostic to out of this thing. It is a scary thing. Um, there are many things that cause these high probability angiograms. And you can see it in everything from clotting problems uh, to intravascular tumors, to atherosclerosis, to vasospastic diseases. So it, it is contextual. This is a contextual study um, uh, by and large when it shows findings of vasculitis, multiple areas, stenosis, ectasia, multiple vascular beds. I will make the case that this patient has RCVS, reversible cerebral vasoconstrictive syndrome. This is the most important mimic of angiographically documented CN, uh, vasculitis. It is remarkably common, remarkably common. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it out, way outnumbers patients with CNS vasculitis. It is readily diagnosed, as I will make the problem, and it is often confused, misdiagnosed, and mismanaged um, based on lack of recognition and declarative and procedural knowledge of how to deal with this. The most important aspect of this, and I just got a, a I just got a call from a neuroradiologist whose wife has this in DC during the last talk, um, is the thunderclap headache. It is a headache that is the worst headache of your life. Comes on within a minute or two, people say my head is gonna blow off. There are all kinds of descriptions. It may be spontaneous, but particularly suspicious when it is uh, precipitated by exercise, se sex, cough, bathing, Valsalva, anxiety can do this. So many stories of this uh, over the years. Um, it may occur once and go away, or it may recur. And when it recurs, it's uh, of, of, of considerable, um, uh, it can be very pernicious in, in, in that setting. I've never seen a patient with CNS vasculitis in 30 years present with a thunderclap headache. So 
In terms of negative predictive value, I'm not saying it can't occur, but um, it bothers me. It's often associated with a variety of settings. It can be seen in the postpartum. It can be after uh, a wide variety of drugs, um, 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 uh, or it could be idiopathic. Um, this is the same patient, um, and this is uh, 14 days later after this remarkable therapy uh, that he received, which was nothing, um, and uh, he is back to normal. And so it's based on recognition. Uh, um, the problem with this patient was is that the diagnosis of arteritis was available. Like, hey, you're at a vasculitis meeting, aren't right here? So you use the availability heuristic um, uh, because that's what we're talking about. Um, secondly, um, uh, you know, you might be thinking that, that uh, you know, I've just seen a couple of these this year. That angiogram looks just like the last one I saw. It's probably CNS vasculitis. So um, that would be um, uh, uh, the availability heuristic. Instead, um, patients like this, and patients like rheumatologists see all the time, we need to take diagnostic timeouts, particularly when the stakes are high and the, and the, and the diagnosis is not in our hand. And consider alternatives and play devil's advocate. Could this be spasm? Could this be an infection despite this thing? You ask yourself those questions. These are, this is how we, we teach diagnostic re, uh, reasoning um, uh, and this is the way we should be reflective. So it's being self-aware of how we're making these diagnoses. RCVS, if you, if you take away anything from this, that those of you that are um, uh, not highly familiar with it, um, these are patients that generally have multifocal vasoconstriction um, uh, that have occurred in the wake of a thunderclap headache. They have no evidence of an aneurysm. Recall that the patient that comes into the ER with the worst headache of their life, <laughs> you're worrying about subarachnoid hemorrhage from a ruptured aneurysm. There are many other causes of, 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 of thunderclap headaches, this being one of them. Um, so they can't have an aneurysm. They should have a pretty pristine spinal fluid. And um, uh, when this uh, is uh, all in place, um, uh, we, know, we can document that this is gradually reversible over about 28 days. And if you follow these people by indirect angio or transcranial Doppler, about 2 or 3% of these are relentless, progressive, and fatal. And we don't know what to do about those. Um, uh, but 97% of people get better. Um, uh, we usually use calcium channel blockers. It seems to help their headache, but we have no evidence that it does anything to permanently or, or accelerate the improvement. There is some data to suggest that glucocorticoids may actually uh, be associated with a worse clinical course, but this may be um, uh, some a bias and uh, channeling bias, um, but uh, we, we tend to be um, uh, very conservative with this. So this is a, another case of a 46-year-old guy with four months of progressive confusion, memory loss, headache, and visual blurring. So he's got a headache, he's got some non-focal findings, um, doesn't, have a normal doesn't have a normal spinal fluid. He's got a lot of protein, six WBCs. Um, MR uh, basically shows some punctate infarctions and some atrophy, and he has this angiogram. And all through the angiogram, it's all these ratty vessels. All these ratty vessels are kind of small and they're just irregularly irregular. And he has cytologies, cultures, emboli, um, uh, uh, pan CT, um, uh, looking for uh, more pernicious uh, causes in the periphery. So he has an unexplained neurologic deficit. He has a high probability angiogram. Um, must rule outs uh, have been done to the best of our ability. So next step. Glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids and cytoxan, or biopsy. I mean, what else could it be? Now you're really scared. Okay. Um, so the diagnostic reasoning of this is that, are there any red flags uh, 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 present? These are red flags, but he's, he's had uh, uh, an LP. 
Um, um, and um, this, this guy, I, I'm cutting this short, he actually got cyclophosphamide and prednisone and is not, uh, did not respond after about 10 or 12 weeks. And then the ultimately um, uh, biopsy did reveal that he had an intravascular lymphoma. It's a B-cell neoplasm. Uh, it can be isolated to brain, it can be systemic, sometimes it can be in skin and liver, and it can be accessible. Uh, this is, a, this is a, the most um, seamless mimic of CNS vasculitis. Uh, we see this every now and then, and it's a, it's a terrible uh, differential diagnosis. Um, uh, the, all the patients that I've ever seen have had this similar type of angiogram. They don't have uh, medium vessels, mostly the small vessel stuff. So uh, you're thinking very well, this should have been done at the beginning. Um, the, the, the last case I'll show, I have a couple of uh, minutes here. This is such a good case, and I've shown this uh, over the past eight months um, in these talks. So this is a, uh, I'm going to cut to the chase because I want to get, uh, get us back on time. It's a woman that actually has RA, not on much immunosuppression, no biologics, prednisone. Um, she's had uh, uh, four weeks of uh, ocular inflammation that was felt to be anophthalmitis. Looks like an infection, a uh, big suppurative uh, ocular inflammatory disease. Yet at the same time, it was pan-cultured, um, uh, including uh, vitriol culture, and everything is negative. Mycobacteria, fungi, uh, uh, all the candidate viruses, uh, special stains, etc. Treated aggressively with Vanco, Ceftaz, Vori, um, and not getting better. Um, so the eye is bad. Um, it looks like an inflammatory thing. Um, uh, 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 ID finds no evidence of any pathogens. Um, and now uh, uh, has uh, these mental status changes um, and has this MR. That's Abby Normal, by the way. All right, so. uh, not good. So these multiple uh, uh, areas of increased uh, signal. Um, uh, kind of bizarre looking um, uh, that uh, actually have uh, progressed over time. So uh, this is not looking good, right? So everybody here, if, heck, if you're going to biopsy the last one, you're definitely going to biopsy this one. Um, so this patient gets tapped, got 300 cells, protein, um, glucose of 30, and this is the workup that's done. And this is, you know, anything that you can think of uh, that has been done here um, uh, has been done in terms of uh, pathogen um, uh, discovery. And everything is negative. All right, so you got the biopsy, not, not going to biopsy, and here's the biopsy. Juicy, pan arteritis um, uh, with these big uh, 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 activated histiocytes here, uh, pan arteritis, and... Uh, so here's the patient, and uh, got this ocular inflammatory thing, it's got this brain thing here, biopsy in hand. You got three choices. Um, uh, start high dose steroids, steroids and cyclo, additional diagnostics. If you can think of something, then you shout it out. According to the book, all right. So we have thirty percent of people are going to do additional diagnostics. All right. Now, if you know this case, you can't say anything because this is a published case. Um, and if you, if you, what else would you do? What? Well, 30% of you have, a, have chose this, and so at least one person could say what they're going to do. <laughs> Call somebody or, I don't know. Okay. That's great. Um, so this case um, was presented to us um, uh, by uh, Faisenmeyer visiting professor Michael Wilson, um, who uh, works at UCSF in the laboratory of Joe DeRisi. And they are uh, uh, leaders in um, uh, uh, 
agnostic uh, molecular diagnoses. So this case has several red flags. There's a low glucose here. It's not good. Uh, we, we just don't like this. And you know, just because we haven't been able to find the pathogen doesn't meet it. Secondly, now you've got this patient with brain vasculitis and this eye thing going on. They don't go together necessarily in, in PACNS. So, you know, if you say this is still vasculitis because I can't find anything, you're anchoring. You're anchoring right now because you're just saying, okay, it's that plus something else I don't understand. And I, I would not have, this would have been a terrible situation to be in. Uh, but at that point in time, um, uh, and, and for those of you that are, are, are um, uh, Occam's razor, I'm much more of a Alfred Nord Whitehead. Uh, seek simplicity, but distrust it. So this is a case uh, that actually uh, was diagnosed uh, by metagenomic deep sequencing. And um, uh, Rula and I are now collaborating uh, with their lab for um, uh, uh, a number of cases uh, that have moved to this end. So basically, this is the next wave of, of uh, microbial diagnosis. Uh, this starts uh, with RNA uh, made into, uh, 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 which is expanded into uh, uh, a cDNA um, uh, library. Um, it is then uh, subtracted out the, the uh, DNA of the host. What's left is then read off of major uh, 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 DNA databases such as BLAST and looking for uh, uh, abnormal extra reads. The organism is Balamuthia manduralis, um, uh, which uh, is well known to actually cause this. And what was interesting is that there were two errors. And this actually doesn't happen very much. Diagnostic errors are almost always on cognitive specialists. It's a fact. Radiologists make very few errors. Pathologists make very few errors. But this biopsy, which showed these activated histiocytes, those were not uh, uh, histiocytes. Those were the parasites. They look exactly like them. And this has been reported time and time and time again. Um, um, and uh, basically, this is the sequence. This can be shown. Um, they've published many things. And it's actually proprietary. And there are many sources and many laboratories that are doing this. This is a, a Nijem paper on um, uh, neuroleptospirosis done by the same uh, 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 agnostic metagenomic technique. Where this now enters into the diagnosis, I don't really know. Um, there are other parasites that can do the same thing, including acanthamoeba. Treatment and outcome, I have nothing to say about the treatment of CNS vasculitis. Um, it's uh, sea level evidence. Uh, the best practices are, uh, it really requires, it's a team sport. This is not a single person sport. And uh, it really requires people that know a little bit about all of these things, including uh, very interested pathologists, uh, neurosurgeons who are genuinely interested in doing these procedures, not forced to do them, um, neuroradiologists who uh, um, uh, don't have hubris about their techniques. Um, and um, you know, a few adages apply. So the, uh, the great Sir William says, the value of experiences is not seeing a lot, but just seeing it wisely. So seeing a few cases can really do this.